Welcome to the MindC podcast series, Moving Digital Health. Our guest today is Yuhan Sonin, Creative Director at GoInvo. Hey, Yuhan, how are you doing today? Oh, I have a pulse. At least I'm pretty sure I do. Okay, that's a good start. Maybe you could introduce yourself a little bit and uh, talk about your background and we'll go from there. Well, I'm not that interesting. Uh, However... Since we're talking a little bit about digital health, that's where I live. I live in the design of services for how patients uh, should or could or want to engage with their health. Um, And the same goes for clinicians. Clinicians have been, unfortunately, not paid attention to in the design world as much for the past 30 years, and their lives have gotten harder. And so if you're not paying attention to both sides, patients and clinicians, I think you're uh, not doing our job as system designers. But then you need to also consider, hey, there's this thing called policy. It helps to change the law if you want to change health outcomes. Mm -hmm. And that's something also we not just dabble in, but actively storytell, create prototypes for it to show proof of principle. And that is also part of our quiver of design gigs. Excellent. Maybe could you give an example of, you know, a, a project that you're working on, you know, that has, you know, those multiple elements in it of the, you know, the user side and the, and the clinician side? It's often the case where you're actually designing for one of the parties Mm -hmm. and not necessarily designing for both at the same time. That's also a problem in healthcare is that you're positioned to say, hey, the clinicians are suffering because they're using Epic or Cerner, you name your electronic medical record Borg entity of choice. Yeah. And they're having these specific problems with prior authorization, with uh, how crazy the note taking is during encounters, Um, the overhead in some small clinics actually having to code the encounter after the fact, meaning, you know, how do I pay for this? So there's lots of things that have to deal with the clinician alone or with administ- uh, the administrivia or the payment part or the prior auth part, and then uh, the diagnosis, God forbid, and treatment. And then there's the other side of the coin, which is, well, how do patients get into the system? How do they get out? Uh, do I have to do this at all? And often, sadly, they don't coexist in the same project in terms of we're doing we're designing both experiences at the same time. Of course, they mm-hmm. coexist. They have to. However, it's often that projects don't do that simultaneously. And I think that's actually a big problem in the healthcare world is that you don't think about all the parties at one time. And that's good system engineering. You look at the entire landscape, the ecosystem of all the crap that has to happen. And yeah, you need to focus on one or two things. But understand the ripple effects that if you do X, Y, and Z for clinicians, that has to impact on the ABC for patients and vice versa uh, or their care teams. And so it's often we're just dealing with one side of that. However, as good designers, as good engineers, as good policy uh, wranglers, you have to understand all sides or many sides of the healthcare form, so to speak. So what are we working on now that's of interest? Well, maybe it's not of interest, but it's what we're working on is uh, that I can talk about it is uh, we're working on one project that comes out of the National Institutes of Health. It's called All of Us. It is a national U.S. program to how do we get more patient representation in the research data that's not just middle-aged white guys like me, we have too many of those as it is, Uh, but how do we actually see a census-like take, a realistic proportional census-like take on the health data of humans that reside in the U.S. and allow researchers to then use that to better create equitable care and see healthcare as it stands. That is a really important program for the nation. 
I think there should be the same kind of thing for the planet where mm-hmm. patients donate their data, maybe get paid to participate and th- know that their data is safe and only going to be used for this kind of research and not for the proliferation of their uh health data to be sold and shepherded to commercial entities, but used for the public good. And that I think is an important kind of project that we need to see more and more of. And that's just one of many projects we work on. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, that is very interesting to me and uh, sounds like an amazing project to work on. How open are people to sharing their data? Do you find that when you talk about the, reasons and the, the, the uses and the, the way that data is going to be used, are they on board or are they really hesitant to, uh, to share? Well, our minds have been pillaged over the past 20 years uh, because that's the last bastion of capitalism is how do we extract our experiences <laughs> from from us that's where money is being made uh you know the googles of the world the amazons of the world uh have been mining that the healthcare world has been sucking it up across the planet and what we're seeing at least in our research and lots of other people's research is you know 15 10 years ago donating your data to science your healthcare data it was like an 80% rule. Most mm-hmm. patients, when they're approached, is like, hell yeah, sign me up for that. You're a hospital system. You're doing a brain uh, uh, research or you know primary care research or all sudden, yeah, go, take it and go. What you're seeing because of the proliferation of the surveillance state and surveillance capitalism uh, idea is that it's been contracting a little bit. So I think we've lost about 20 points on that 80 to 60 or half of people now are pretty damn wary. I think everyone's wary of where the hell their data is going in some way. Uh, How can it be used against me? How can it be used for me? Is less of a a story, unfortunately. Uh, But I think we have to be very diligent in how we tell both sides of that coin. Mm-hmm. And so I think so far it has been downturning over the past decade for some good reasons and some for not so good reasons. And so right now, I think usually the pickup is about half the people that you ask would say, yeah, I think under the right circumstances, uh, I'll donate my data to research. Uh, and, and that's, you know, OK, uh, I'll take half. That's still a huge amount of humans who would participate. Yeah. So on one side, it's it's good that people are more aware of their data and their you know their right to, to own that data and what might happen after they donate it. But like you say, on the other side, that constriction of, of data actually means there's you know less to, to mine. But there is you know so many people in the U.S. that that's still a, a lot of uh, data to work with. Uh, you mentioned one of the challenges being the diversity of data in terms of. Uh, you know, ethnographically and uh, I guess, you know, age and, and gender, gender. What's, what are the factors that go into that? Well, uh, who has the spare time to conduct surveys and do surveys and sit with a, a large chunk of paper? Uh, you know, this was 15, 20 years ago or now with their mobile device, and uh, think about, well, how am I uh, doing and how do I respond to this research question? That is a luxury <laughs> in a lot of yeah. people's lives. Yeah. And, and so that's why uh, it's been a fair, fairly upper crusty response rate traditionally to these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. I think that's been changing over time because researchers, one, are recognizing that, hey, can I do very small little chunks of investigation. Can I get 10 10 data points in 20 seconds? Uh, Not so bad, not so shabby. Also, can I pay patients to participate? What a concept. Uh, This is going to become more and more a thing as patients have more and more control over their data, where pharma will rent out part of your data set for six months in order to see, okay, are you improving? What can we learn about you? And they'll give you a hundred bucks a month or whatever that may be. And mm-hmm. that's not chump change for a lot of people. It can pay their cell phone bill and their, their, you know, if they have a pet, their 
pet expenses or something, right? That's yeah. that's pretty great. So I think that is be going to tilt it again back to the sharing model is, can I have control over it? Who am I going to control it with? Is it a limited time frame? Uh, can I get paid for that? Uh, am I actually doing good for patients like me? And I think there are a lot of factors there that will help increase the sharing over time, or at least the depth of sharing. And, you know, on the other side of it, uh, you know, what are some of the use cases for this uh, more div diversified data pool uh, once you have it? Oh, there are a lot uh, of potential uses. And you're, you're, you know, the thing with all of us, what they have done here is they've made a, a conscious push to not go after the middle, uh, middle class, upper middle class uh, and wealthy health users uh, mm -hmm. and humans and patients, yeah, they have made a real effort to say, well, how do we make sure we get a representative sample of people who live in the city, who live in rural uh, parts of the U.S., uh, you know, through IHS, Indian Health Service, through uh, clinics, local clinics, and you have to do this with intent uh, or else it won't work. And that's, I think it's a, it's a a good example of doing that pretty well. Uh, so what can you do then with that information? Well, this is pretty wide open. It would be fantastic to actually then, I mean, my more of a fantasy is you're starting to build data pools of humans for research that can look at and predict disease in advance, or, hey, uh, we have uh, clinical decision services, these little microservices that predict in advance or tell us what's happening with our bodies. Like there's the classic one with uh, five data points about age, sex, uh, height, weight, and smoking that says, okay, here's your risk uh, for high blood pressure and heart attack. It's well known. There are many different little clinical decision services like that. Mayo has, Mayo Clinic has it. Uh, the American Heart Institute, uh, Association has one. Uh, more and more of those kind of little services that can help everybody mm -hmm. learn a little bit about what's happening inside them, but it's all based on real data. And people who look more and more like me or act like me or live like me, that becomes more and more important when you're making predictions about your health. And so for, for as a patient and as a clinician, I would think those kind of little services are very important to come out of the research fairly quickly. And my hope is, too, that those little nuggets of predictions aren't then tied to the institutions where they were born because the data was built by patients and they often are restricted. Uh, for instance, Stanford's or Mayo clinics are copyrighted and patented and then closed only to be used by them. Mm -hmm. um, now it, on the broader things like blood pressure, that's, those are pretty well known. And I think many of them are open or at least open to use anything more complicated or uh, otherworldly than that. They're all closed off and, housed inside those, quote, nonprofit institutions. So I think this is the hope is that more and more open research can be done and open science in order for all of us to get a little better clue of what's happening in us. Mm -hmm. And of course, more data is better uh, from a research point of view. So, you know, in terms of the types of data collected here. Is it? Is it always more data or is it the quality of the data from a statistically relevant sample size? Yes, uh, 100%. The, the quality, uh, I guess when I say more, I was thinking about like per individual, uh, the amount of data points you get from one person, I'm guessing more is, is better. Would that be correct to say? Well, uh, getting a fuller picture of someone, uh, yes, I, I agree. There is more and more power in that as you collect more and more. And maybe you're collecting the same data point many times in a random pattern, or maybe not so random, uh, over the years, so that you can see a normalized view of that data, because there may be a few of those data pickups that are not so good, they're not so precise. Uh, 
But to your point, if you're getting enough sample of that same data point over a year versus one time that you show up to a clinic um, versus a hundred times during the year, that might be a much better data pool. So to your point, yes, that can be useful. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, is DNA part of that data set that is, is being collected? Because when you start looking at, at uh, you know, DNA and then the, the, how that affects, uh, you know, different ethnic populations, you can also see, you know, broader trends of, you know, disease or risk factors at that level, right? Yes. There have been many studies in the past and now uh, current studies that use your genome, your DNA, your protein level descriptions of you as a human as part of the research. So all of us does use, uh, does use blood and saliva and uh, uh, kits uh, to gather different data points about it. One of which is your genome or parts of your uh, parts of it SNPs uh, for you know, the whole country of Iceland did it. What is it already eight years ago? I think where everyone was sequenced. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. We're going to get closer to that. I think over time where as part of birth, you are sequenced. The crazy thing is I actually think that should happen much earlier mm -hmm. that it, you get sequenced in, you know, week 16, that's going, uh, uh, and now that gets scary for a lot of people very quickly is, yeah. uh, you know, can you start to do, uh, 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 things with humans uh, prenatally and, and eradicate some disease. I know people are going to freak out and they should freak out, but I think these are things you have to talk about uh, that are not comfortable, but that's where you can see this, the, the issue going is uh, can you eradicate disease in advance? So they're, they've already started to do in essence, parts of that through in vitro fertilization through IVF, mm -hmm. selecting the cells that will survive. That is one kind of parsing. And so you're doing that at the protein level in essence. So something to think about, I don't have an answer there. Um, it's a tricky one and now only available to those who can afford it, but that's coming. There are a lot of ethical questions there, but you also see the, the power and the benefit of, you know, collecting that data on a, a population level and the good that can do as well. Right. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting to, to see the, the trend and, and where things are going there. Well, we uh, need law, by the way, to criminalize the pejorative use of our health data that does not exist here in the disunited States. So that if we have a national law that sets up guide rails, that for how companies, how individuals, how nonprofit groups, how the government can use your data, I think that uh, would be a key aspect of assuaging some fear, not all, but some, and having criminal liability in releasing your data and accidentally losing it, so to speak, uh, in using it in nefarious ways. That to mm -hmm. me is a, a critical national priority for the US. Yes, it does feel like the Wild West a little bit right now in terms of uh, health data that there's still in regulations are behind uh, the you know, industry uh, and uh, the corporate world in terms of you know, how that data is used. You mentioned before your work to influence policy uh, to, uh, to help push for change there. Maybe we could uh, talk about that a little bit. Fire away. What are some of the, you know, specific uh, policies um, that, you know, you would like to see changed in the U.S.? Woo! Well, let's. <laughs> that is a, a, a Feel hard free to question. pick and choose one, or uh, uh, because there, yeah, there might be a lot there. Well, it, it's this is okay. Let's start with healthcare since we're talking about healthcare. Yes. Um, uh, I think there are a lot of things that stem from the chaos, the designed chaos of our system to extract the most dollars from humans. 
So there's a profit over people mantra that has been going on for, you know, 50 years in this country. So we need to do a few things in order to temper that enthusiasm for the mighty dollar, which is one, we need some public option for humans, residents, citizens of the country, whether that's a you know complete universal health care system that, you know, that abolishes private health care or has some private health care options that many countries do and has a larger public option for anybody who doesn't want job tied insurance or coverage. And we already have one of the biggest public health systems in the planet with uh, CMS, Medicaid and Medicare. And yet I think we need to the first, uh, there'd be several laws that I would work on. Can we drop the age of Medicaid, uh, Medicare by 10 years every five years or something like that until all of a sudden it becomes Medicare for all? Mm-hmm. You can still have private options and the actual implementing of care, the actual doling out of care is probably done by private entities, right? So that could be CMS really just becomes Centers for Medicaid, Medicare becomes a benefits handler and the private entities become where health happens or how it's manifested. That to me would be a pretty good one to start to look at. There are lots of other things in healthcare, like uh, crushing the sugar lobby. (laughs) Uh, We eat really badly. Uh, the food, uh, you know, what we throw into our gullets uh, has massive subsidies from the U.S. government. What subsidies should we be doing for farming in this country, for uh, lobbies in this country uh, should be another thing we should look at. Um, we should most likely instigate a patient data ownership rule that puts the patient as the owner or co-owner of their data, at least as much as law can allow, because there's some things when you walk into a clinic and you have a communicable disease, they need to report that to their local CDC and up the chain, but that you have a little more control over your data. That would be another uh, uh, piece of legislation that we could work on. Uh, Should we decriminalize drugs, period, so that if you use, you are not a criminal? You're seeing more and more of that with the opioid crisis or catastrophe where uh, police, at least here in the Republic of Arlington, Massachusetts, and in Salem were the first in the country to decriminalize uh, most opioid overdoses so that um, they're not hauling you off to jail. They're actually giving you Narcan. Every cop uh, has Narcan on their waist. And uh, they can revive you and then they bring you to treatment. Why? Well, the first thing, it's actually cheaper. (laughs) It is cheaper. But then, God forbid, there are better health outcomes if you get someone to treatment versus shoving them in a jail cell. Yeah. Um, So uh, there's another one. So I just listed four quickies. Uh, If you want, I can send you a whole list that I have that I have posted on my wall of health law that this country should consider. So how have you used your background in design and uh, user experience to help communicate or advocate for these policy changes? Our job as, as designers, as engineers, is to, one, understand the problem sets. Mm-hmm. Two, start to think about, well, how do we solve these things with the people that are suffering with these problems? And three, be able to convince people uh, that they should get on the bandwagon and this is a problem and here's a potential solution or five of them. And uh, we we often ignore the convincing other people vibe or thread. And that is something that we... I dig myself into the, oh yeah, these uh, amazing pixels are going to change someone's mind. No, 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 no. They rarely do. They're rarely beautiful enough uh, images uh, and experiences that without uh, 
a little honey and flowers and convincing and arm twisting and crowbars that uh, you can actually get something into production into people's hands, into their silicon bricks in their pockets. And so that is, I think, a critical aspect of engineering and design and system engineering is, can you convince can you show evidence? Can you create a story that says, this is exactly the problem, why we need to attack it, and how we're going to solve it? And I'm gonna, your, your butt is going to be, then to this, throwing money on the table, and you're going to be bloodletting for this. Now, that's a little harder, but uh, that is a skill that is required. And we're still honing our chops at this. One recent example, maybe that you're uh, referring to, is the ownyourhealthdata.org and .com, both. They go to two different yeah. URLs. That we made a little graphic novella for humans in Massachusetts and hopefully in the U.S. to read and to see, written at a fifth grade level, uses you know high. Uh, it uses pictures and graphic narratives to tell a story of why we need to think about this. And it does it in such a way I think many people can understand it so that a fifth grader could at least start to say, oh, this is, I got to think about this a little bit. And there's the companion piece, which is the white paper, which has, you know, 25 references and previous yeah. law and uh, that describe for the health analyst, the chief medical officer, chief information officer, here's some of the evidence uh, written for more an academic style. So you have different audiences. And then you need the, the rule makers, the lawmakers, the, public, the publicly elected individuals in our cities and states and country that need to understand this as well. So draft small pieces of legislation. How can you outline the five points that a piece of legislation should have? And so you need these three vectors, at a, I think at a minimum, to start getting humans to care. And that's what we have to do is you have to do it through multiple different ways because different humans act and react differently to different things. And that's a start at how to bend minds and change behavior in order to get ideas pushed and live. Hmm. And what kind of response have you had from this? Do you see a lot of people getting on board and saying, yeah, I uh, totally agree. Like, let's make this happen. And like, you know, is there a groundswell on that? Or is it is it a hard conversation to, to get people aligned with? A dec uh, this idea has been around for decades. De mm -hmm. Patient data ownership, decades and decades. I think when we stumbled onto it, close to 20 years ago, it was sort of a side channel for us. And then, you know, 10 years ago, it became a bigger deal because you could, you saw it happening in our lives all the time. And still then it was massive pushback from most, even health advocates. The, the story wasn't clear enough. We weren't doing a good enough job. I think we're just having a number of things braiding like a river now, both in culture and in technology and in uh, what's happening in the world and how people are making money, how healthcare is working, that there's a confluence of ideas collecting that make it a little more approachable and understandable. And we've also honed our story, too, over the past decade. And there is a lot of, yeah, of course we have to do this. Um, and Clini the clinical side, I think, will put up a little bit of a fight. Uh, well, probably a big fight because they own the data right now. Usually mm -hmm. that's in law, too. So in I think half the states, it's in law that the providers own the data. In the other half, it's murky, but always typically will default to the providers owning the data. There's one state, the state of New Hampshire, which does have it in law. The patients own co-own the data. However, the judge in that original case, about I think 18 months ago, two years ago, said, well, that wasn't the intent. So all of a sudden you have like a law that could have been a precedent for the rest of the country now sort of being um, hammered by the same judge that ruled it in the first place. So uh, this is a long-winded way of saying We've gotten a little better in how we tell our story mm -hmm. and the public has been more and more aware of how their data is being misused. Um, 
And yet we have a long way to go because you're still not having a consensus in the healthcare world of data ownership, patient data ownership. You're going to get, it's still a big fight. You have big hospital systems who are siphoning off or, or starting their own companies based on our data and nothing's coming back to the patient. We didn't sign up for this. Mm-hmm. We didn't opt out, couldn't opt out for Truveta, for instance, like in Puget Sound region. Uh, I think over half of all people who live in the Seattle area, their data is now being used in a company that was spun off by a half dozen hospitals called Truveta in order for them to then sell the data for research and for commercial uses. And no one had, no patient said, yo, sure, go ahead and do that. It was, uh, they use the DOAs, the data use agreements that yeah. still put the clinicians, the, or the hospital systems in control. And there was no, op- no way for patients to say, yeah, I don't want any care because I'm having a heart attack. Um, you can't use my data as uh, any way you want. What are you going to do? You're under duress. They're not reading the entire terms and conditions. No, no, no human does that. And, uh, and they're preying on all of us. And so I think you're seeing a slow change to that effect. That's my, at least my hope. Mm-hmm. Uh, it brings up a good point because you, like a lot of the agency has been taken away from the, the patient in terms of, you know, what happens to their data a lot of times after, uh, after it's been taken in. Uh, what do patients, you know, really want or, you know, need from digital health services? Uh, I think we talked a little bit about this uh, before, but, you know, us as, you know, we're a UX and, and uh, you know, software development agency, we're, you know, building solutions for various, you know, niche problems. And, you know, it's all, you know, hopefully to, to benefit the patient and, and their health, but, you know, what do you hear from them in terms of, you know, what they're looking for from the, uh, the, the system or health services uh, um, that's going to make the most impact in their lives? Well, patients don't want to think about their health. Mm-hmm. Humans don't want to think about their health at all. <laughs> so the, the fact that we're dabbling and swimming or sinking in my case in the healthcare world is because my nose is in it and because I have been in it for a while and I design for it every day, uh, I am highly interested in it. But as a species, our biology, for the most part, our brains are telling us who gives a shit. We don't want to think about our health. We don't have want to have to think about it. And those that do, you know, have a chronic disease, they don't want to think about it either, but their livelihoods are at stake. Mm -hmm. So they have to think about it in some way. And uh, for, you know, when you're younger, you're full of piss and vinegar and you, you know, you feel invincible, at least, you know, uh, uh, some of us do. And you get a little older and you start to feel, okay, this is what it is to age a bit. But then you start to think about health a little bit more. And that increases because we're forced to think about it because our bodies are not reacting uh, or doing the things that we have grown up with. If we're lucky enough to have, you know, no serious conditions. So look, you're, we're fighting biology here and our brains to say, oh yeah, think about your healthcare now. Think about your healthcare now. Think about your healthcare now. And it's annoying as hell. It's, we don't want to think about it. So that is the prevailing gust of torrential wind right. that, uh, that should be thought about in the healthcare world and digital services. Don't make me think about it. But when I have to, make it beautiful. Make it highly lubricated so I don't have to think much about it or I can get up the curve very quickly. Or guess what? Someone else who is is very knowledgeable at this can help navigate me through the healthcare space. And sometimes those will be a combination of digital little services with humans. That -hmm. has been a very good combination, at least recently, where whether you're in triage, whether you're in get me a little help right now, I'm in trouble, whether it's I have a condition, I just got diagnosed, uh, help me OB1. And that OB1 service will be a community healthcare worker armed with their cell phone or a nurse uh, 
uh, nurse practitioner walking you through options and, and showing you live, hey, this is your condition. Here's what you can do about it. Those are, I think, the next interesting little services that more and more of us will have in, at our disposal 24-7, 365. Because mm-hmm. this idea of primary care being eight to eight or eight to five is ridiculous. I I sympathize with the clinicians uh, because they're overworked and crazed, but we have to think about, you know, how do we do primary care for everybody and do it much better, fund it much differently, and also have a lot of nurses and community healthcare workers involved for, uh, to allow for 24 seven care or access to questions and answers. That's where I think these uh, services should go more and more towards versus the, I have a, you know, there are four people suffering from this. Uh, That's more of a research problem and a really a a different kind of critical need. Uh, There is like the primary care care need, which I think trumps almost everything. I can't use that word anymore, but you know, that's, that's where we need to go more. Yeah. Uh, I I definitely see your your point that a lot of people just don't want to think about it uh, until they're confronted with it. And it, you know, it hits them in the face and like, Oh, now uh, I very much have to think about my health. Um, but there seems there's a, a, another segment of population that is very concerned about their health. And it's, you know, usually people of a certain age and, and demographic that are, you know, buying all the, the Apple watches and Fitbits and, you know, connected uh, health uh, sensors like, uh, you know, the Aura. Uh, and they're almost, you know, obsessed with, you know, uh, gathering data and uh, in knowing about their health. Um, but it, it doesn't seem to be the, uh, the norm. They're the exception to, to the rule, right? Yeah. It's a small, small percentage of people who can afford an Apple watch for that matter. But most people do have a cell phone in their pocket. I think it's, you know, 94% of all United Statesians have a cell phone in their pocket. That is a health device. Yeah. Uh, Hell, you know, the, your, your, your cell phone has millions of data points about you. That's a health device. Your electronic health record at a clinic, probably if you're lucky, has 150 data points about you. Which would you trust with getting data about your health more? hundred To your earlier point, 150 that the clinician has or the quarter million or million that your cell phone has? Uh, it's a pretty obvious choice. Um, yes. And uh, uh, so that, that's, that's one way I look at it. Uh, there's also this thing where we don't even have good enough food science to say, <laughs> uh, what exactly based on your gut should you be eating and your biome? I mean, mm-hmm. that's just burgeoning. And that would be fantastic so that we can have something that's much more uh, uh, that's adjudicated by our own data, our digital twin and code, but also our gut and what's happening inside us. Um, we don't have good uh, diet data and research at the moment to say what exactly we should be eating. Now, there's the Michael Pollan line of thinking, which is excellent, is eat less mostly green and, you know, they go that way and less meat. Yeah. Right. And that's a human kind of care plan. Uh, after that, it gets a lot more hazy about uh, our diet. And uh, that's the kind of thing we also need more research put into is how do we start to get much more uh, adjusted diets for us? Now, I think if we just ate better, more green stuff and ate less, we'd be a much healthier uh, planet for a number of reasons, but uh, that's a whole separate ball of wax. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, there's a standard diet advice for anyone, uh, eat more of the good stuff and and less of the the bad stuff, but connecting the dots between a unique individual, their uh, their age, their body type, uh, you know, their uh, deficiencies and exactly what's the best diet for that person is uh, we're still not there yet. Yeah, we're not. And okay, we'll, we'll get there. We're slowly inching our way forward. There's also this angle of why are some of us really concerned or really interested in the data about our health is 
we want a way to see health really early, like in advance, so that it becomes much more of a stage zero attack on healthcare, where it's just burgeoning. And you can then treat it much differently so that it's not, once it becomes this giant radish growing out of your shoulder blade, uh, that's a different kind of (laughs) health intervention, right? That is way too freaking late. Yeah, you want it to happen. You And so I think there is this underlying desire to, one, not think about health, but also have the services, these little robots, these little services, these other helpful humans in my life uh, and digital services to see things in advance before they manifest into that radish. But really at the at the protein level, uh, that's the 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 Star Trek component of this, which um, that is, I think, the fantastic part of what's happening in, in research over the past you know, several decades is I think there's a Ting lab at Harvard that's looking at how proteins, when they are created off the off your strands, you know, they're they're basically two mirrored images of themselves. But the second something um, in, the, in the one in uh, many, many hundreds of millions that replicates badly, um, that's the beginning of something either that has to be taken care of or manifest into weirdness in your bloodstream, in your body. And they're looking for and trying to create little uh, other bots, other proteins that can identify them and nuke them at the point of replication or near after they're replicated. So because that's what turns into disease. And I think those are the kind of things that we're trying to inch towards is make me healthier so that I don't have to think about it, but do it at the cellular level way before I can see it. That's the problem is when you go to the doctor now, it's because you've been feeling it for six months and I've been in denial about it. Uh, I, I just saw, so there's a blood vessel that came out. Um, I have abdominal pain, but I've been actually uh, shedding blood cells in my urine for the past two weeks. Well, what the hell? Your toilet should be saying, hey, it's a matter of life or death. Um, you could be having kidney stones, right? You'll, you're not in pain yet, but we're noticing the blood cells in your pee. That's the kind of thing that, yeah, it's technically advanced. It's coming. It's sort of here. There's some already you know, toilets that do this, but it's not for the mass public yet. But that's, I think, part of the desirement in these technological solutions is seeing healthcare in advance at the stage zero or 0.1. That to me is the is sort of, uh, I think, the push and the excitement with how health could manifest. Yeah, keeping people out of the hospital and you know, getting ahead of uh, conditions before it becomes uh, acute care, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting to think about all the possibilities. Uh, and I think one of the questions I was going to ask you are, you know, what are the, you know, the innovations that, you know, you're most excited about that you see coming in the future? I think you've already, you know, uh, touched on some of them there. Uh, but there are there any others uh, that you see are, are on the horizon uh, in the in the digital health field? Well, it's, it's going to be the combination of sensors. Uh, all types of different sensors picking up things for us during our everyday behavior. So, uh, you know, that's something that we've been uh, noodling on and uh, lots of people have been noodling on is this idea of your bathroom turning into a health room, really. And with the urinalysis in your toilet, with, you know, your, your, when you touch your sink, you're sloughing off an amazing, amazing data set there of your biome right. every day. Uh, so these bio stories and these collectors can do, uh, hopefully over time, some amazing analysis for us. And we don't change our behavior at all. We're just walking in the bathroom, doing our thing, um, number one or number two, brushing our teeth, taking a shower. Your hair follicles are going everywhere. This is more, uh, you know, sounds more Gattaca-ish, but we're actually getting much closer to this than we were a decade ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, to me, is this idea of a constant review of systems. You know, that's the, you know, the clinical way of, of saying, well, what's the little bit of information about you every day that we're picking up to look at trends to say, oh, we think this is happening and this could occur in a couple of weeks or in a year if you keep going down this trend. That's 
where you're seeing things in advance that begin to help me not think about healthcare some more, right? And yeah. uh, you know, your your gait being tr- attracted a little bit for you and only you. Uh, by your devices. That's a big indicator, how you're walking, how you're not walking, uh, how you're moving, and through your eyeballs, uh, through basic fundus cameras, pretty cheap, not the huge Zeiss, you know, $10,000 ones you see at the ophthalmologist, things like that. But uh, those are also excellent to see disease in advance in the blood, in the blood vessels of your eye. It's mm-hmm. the very few places in the human body you can look in blood vessels without using a knife. That is right. one right right in your eyeball yeah. uh, where you can see disease in advance. So these are the kind of things that uh, are make me hopeful for the kind of stage zero detection game that healthcare uh, is going towards. That is pretty damn amazing. So sound, listening to your voice over time, you can hear disease in your voice. You can hear disease and see disease through your eyes, through your face, through your gait, that to, and through your urine and other little metrics every day. And as long as I am not having to fat finger this damn shit in there every day, God, that just drives me bananas. No human wants to do that. If it does it invisibly, we're going to be a, a much different kind of species because all of a sudden, guess what? Your toilet is going to be saying, I'm going to send you a little kit <coughs> and it's going to arrive in your doorstep tomorrow. And this is, you know, with a biome kit or something like that specific that labs need to pick up because, you know, something locally can't do it. And it'll be the living lab of you and your family at home. That yeah. starts to get interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, the future does sound amazing, but, you know, will it be a more equitable healthcare system? Because, you know, the danger is it's it's the wealthy that, you know, are sitting on the golden toilet that, you know, is collecting all the, the health data and, you know, solving their uh, diseases before they even happen. Uh, and it's the, the marginalized populations that, uh, you know, know nothing about their data because they don't have the smart toilet and, uh, you know, all the bots and gadgets are working for them. Uh, and again, are at a disadvantage. They are. Yeah. And it's a. Uh... So, so that's, that's why a lot of research right now in getting little tidbits uh, about people and helping people has been on the phone because mm-hmm. so many people have them and it's a pretty amazing device. Yes, it, it, can ru- it ruins our attention spans right now. It's destroying parts of us. <laughs> it literally is doing that <laughs> to our kids, to us. How many hours uh, a day are people spending on those damn things? Uh, yeah. Way too much. And yeah, it, it lost, is, lost to the gram, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that is, uh, that is its own pandemic in this country. Um, so there, there are lots of things I think we, sh- we should be doing in terms of um, health care that uh, will help some of this. One is I think that by having, uh, for instance, uh, health care for all or in some shape or form, we'll start to say, well, primary care is available to everybody and should be, or that anybody earning under a hundred grand a year gets free primary care. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there should be some stable of effect like that where um, we don't have uh, an eligibility of coverage problem where you have to sign up for Medicaid, apply for Medicaid in a 60 form page uh, on your screens uh, service. It should be much more, hey, uh, the government or this other service is coming to you going, we you qualify for this. We're going to put you on this. Is this okay with you? Oh, yeah, that, that would be great. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're going to have someone come, come to your house or there's actually down the block, there's a community clinic, uh, you know, come in for uh, just a, a hello world kind of experience. That kind of primary care, I think, is critical for equity of health in this country. And we have, uh, there's an excellent, excellent recent paper, or it's actually a book uh, on the uh, primary care. I think it's the um, National Academy of Sciences wrote it, and it came out earlier last year, that marks the key things we have to do as a country to get primary care everywhere, Mm -hmm. that goes everywhere from training of clinicians 
whether they're RNs or MDs, and uh, having programs to fund their care, uh, fund their education, and participate in healthcare in their communities to where they grew up, uh, and uh, having uh, forgiveness or paying for their education. Right now, we're losing clinicians, nurses, and doctors both in droves. We only have about a million doctors in this country less. That does not scale. They mm. do not scale. Uh, and so this, this, this uh, fantastic read, long read, articulates many of the programs we need to support as a country in order to get everyone primary care. And that, to me, is like uh, a, a different level of equity for all. Uh, and I'll have to play this back and, uh, you know, write down uh, all these things and, and then look them up so I can so I can learn more. So I have a question here, Ruben. Yeah, yeah. So, Part of what we also need to think about is, is healthcare a top one or two thing that this country needs to think about? Is it? What, where's, where's the healthcare priority uh, in the country right now? What should the top couple things we concentrate on should be? What are those things? Have you thought about that? Yeah, I, I don't know myself. Like, you know, as a as a Canadian, uh, our healthcare system is is very different, right? So, um, while I'm fairly knowledgeable about the U.S. health system and the the situation there, uh, you know, my own personal experience is very different from yours uh, as an individual. You know, going through the healthcare system, I would say in both countries and around the world, yes, it does need to be a priority. Um, but within that, it's, it's hard to say, you know, what are the priorities within the healthcare system to, uh, make it better? Yeah. Some, okay. So yes, you are uh, right north of the border. Um, and healthcare does exist other places, you know, sometimes, um, uh, I'm in denial, but uh, uh, actually, you know, one thing about uh, the Republic of Canada is that in the Supreme Court, there actually s- said was it, uh, maybe a couple of years ago now that patients do own their health data. So uh, Estonia is really the only country on Spaceship Earth that has it manifested in law. Uh, mm-hmm. Canada is getting there, but it's not implemented yet. But the Supreme Court has been on the patient side, and that's pretty great. But I'm actually then saying that there are bigger things in healthcare. Uh, if we can't solve the climate disaster that we have been culminating for yeah. the past hundred years, who gives a shit if we're going to live 10 years longer because the planet's going to hell? OK, I'm being a little facetious, but yeah, but it, it's a very good point. If we can't figure out the energy, uh, clean energy, then uh, many of us, many of us are going to have a way lower uh life expectancy and uh, level of happiness in our lives. So boom, what? Yeah. Two, if we can't educate ourselves better and better and better over time, that's a pretty critical problem. Uh, and th- that to me is a close number two to energy. And you go down the list. I mean, sh- I mean, for us, I mean, we need term limits for people in Congress and in the Senate. If we can't get term limits, do you think they're going to give a rat's ass about having health care for all? No, they're short sighted because they can be. They can just work week to week and not worry about the long now of human health or human existence. And so there are bigger fish in a lot of ways than just health care. So that's something to think about is what's your list of one to N of what Canada of what the United States, of what Portugal, of what the Ukraine, what Estonia needs to work on in order to become a better and better civilization. And that to me is sort of, I think, trumps my sometimes world, micro world world view of like health software. Yeah. Yeah. It is easy to get focused on, you know, what's right in front of your face uh, and, you know, what the today's problems are. And for the last two years, it's been COVID, right? Like, you know, there's been so much uh, attention around the world of like, you know, how do we uh, get through COVID as as a population, you know, get back to normal. And then all of a sudden the, you know, invasion of Ukraine, like for a Ukrainian, COVID is probably not on their radar as much anymore because they have much bigger problems, 
right? And it just puts things into perspective that you're right. Like, you, uh, you know, healthcare and, uh, um, you know, debates about health data are all fine and good. But, you know, if the larger picture of the, the planet is not healthy, uh, then, you know, we're all screwed anyway, to, to echo your point there. Uh, so lots to think about for sure. Yeah. So, um, my, uh, I'm not channeling Steven Pinker at the moment, you know, the, who has a fairly rosy view on how the planet is or how we're doing as a species. Um, I, I can get a little um, down on what's happening, but we still have to fight. And that's mm-hmm. the, the a key thing is if we have sort of rolled over like a turtle and said, ah, I'm done, then we're done. Uh, so we have to feel like we are fighting for something and then fighting for the right thing. It's, it's about prioritization. Like you said, too, it's like, you, you know, we collectively have to choose what are the most important problems to solve. And if we can align on that, there is a good chance we are going to solve that problem or, you know, find a way to, uh, to, to mitigate or, or work towards a, a solution. But if everyone's going in a di- different direction with different priorities, we, uh, we, yeah, we don't have much hope of solving the big problems. Right on, Brother Ruben. Cool. Johan, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I would love to pick up this conversation another time uh, over a drink next time I'm down in. Oh, we need harder. We need like peyote. You know, we need, we need to go deep. <sighs> okay. Well, we'll, uh, we'll pick the poison and, and set a date for that. Uh, and, and for the, the listeners, if you like this episode, please subscribe to the MindC newsletter and you'll be notified about future episodes. Thank you so much for your time.